Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Ken Costell. I'm the Director of Research Communications here at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, or for those of you don't, who don't know, you will hear it also referred to as HUI. Um, tonight's program is a Morse Colloquium funded by a generous gift from Elizabeth and Henry Morse, Jr. to support public discussion of issues with global importance. It's also being held in conjunction and not coincidentally with a meeting of the Global Library of Underwater of underwater biological sounds. Uh, GLUBS, which is the most pitch perfect acronym ever, is building a non invasive, affordable, and easy to use way for scientists and public to listen to the life beneath the surface, to monitor the changing diversity, distribution, and abundance, and to identify new species. Um, as many of you know, the ocean is largely opaque to light, to radar, to Every, almost every form of electromagnetic radiation. It is, however, remarkably transparent to sound, and much of life in the oceans, lakes, and rivers has evolved to take advantage of this fact. Underwater life uses sound much as we use light and vision to navigate, find food to avoid danger, find mates, and as we'll hear in a moment, to even identify themselves to others. Um, it also, life underwater has also created a marvelous soundscape that carries a wealth of information about the well being of individual animals, species, and entire ecosystems. And this information can in turn help us make decisions about the long term conservation and about and the continued health of the ocean. There has been um, one change to our program this evening. Lucia Di Iorno could not be with us tonight. So uh, instead of finding another speaker, we decided to stick with the three original and carry on. And uh, that'll leave us a little more time for uh, questions and answers at the, uh, at the end. So without further ado, the first person up will be Leila Sei. Leila is a research specialist in the biology department here at Hui. Her work attempts to connect the knowledge of animal sounds with their behaviors which is not nearly as straightforward as a statement as that may seem. Like all of our speakers tonight, she employs some novel tools and technologies in her work, and the knowledge she gains is helping with the restoration and management of critical species and ecosystems. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I'm just gonna start with a little bit of background, although Ken already shared with you a little bit about why it's important to study sound in the ocean. Um, one reason is very important for a lot of marine animals communication. Um, and so I thought I would start with a little um, kind of sampling of some different types of marine animal sounds and actually have you guess uh, what, what might be making these sounds. So I'll um, show you a few possibilities and you can raise your hand what you think it is. So here's the first one. Promise it is an animal. <laughs> Sounds like Star Wars. Oh, whoops, I didn't mean to start it again. All right, so those are our choices. Does anybody think it's a beluga whale? Show of hands, okay. A right whale, okay. How about raw steel? Okay, looks like maybe raw steel one, and that actually is correct. <laughs> so that's an Antarctic steel species and um, makes these kind of crazy sounds that you're still hearing in the background. Um, so, all right, let me move on to the next one. This sound is a lot quieter. Hard for this one. That kind of impulse, now sort of moaning sound. Those are called gunshots. Here are our choices. Anybody think it's a walrus? Okay, right whale, right, and what about sperm whale? All right, looks like once again, the, the majority won. So that was a right whale. That's a very, very highly endangered species um, that's right out offshore here um, that many of you may have heard of. So now the next one is just gonna sound like kind of um, very, oh, that's still the right whale, sorry. So now this is very, very low frequency. These are actually sped up. Um, so these are very um, 
repulsive sounds. So that's either turmoil, anybody think? Okay. And how about harbor seal? Or fin wheel? Okay, it looks like most people got that one. Okay, yes, it is a fin whale. And here's another one. I promise that's an animal. <laughs> I know it doesn't sound like it. All right, how about, anybody think that's a walrus? Okay, how about a polar bear? Oh, arm whale? All right, it is a walrus. <laughs> All right, I think uh, everybody seems to be getting the majority here. Yeah, they make these crazy bell-like sounds. And here's the last one. So this um, high-pitched whistle-like sounds, and then there's some thick sounds. Voices here. Maybe you think that's a white-beaked dolphin. Okay, and a harbor seal. Humpback whale. All right. All right. Everybody knows that one. Okay. So that was a white beak dolphin, and most dolphins do make that combination of whistles and clicks, and I'm going to be showing you some more of those shortly. Um, so, okay. So that was just a little sampling of some different um, marine animal sounds, and now just getting back to, um, you know, why sound is so important. Um, as, as Ken mentioned, um, almost all absorbed in that very top layer of the ocean, um, and uh, yeah, and so these lower zones, twilight and midnight zones, very, very little light is going to be transmitting down there. So visual cues are going to be very um, unimportant at those depths, um, whereas sound travels much faster and farther in water than in air. So um, potentially a, a fin or blue whale um, it, that um, near Newfoundland, Canada, could potentially hear a, a whale singing down in Bermuda about 2,500 kilometers away. Um, not saying that they actually do communicate over those extensive different distances, but but the sounds actually could travel that far. The very low frequency sounds that these whales produce. Um, so the field of marine mammal bioacoustics was actually born here at Huey in the 1940s, with um, the first paper published by Bill Cheville and Barbara Lawrence in 1949, and that paper was looking at the sounds of beluga whales. And Cheville uh, needed someone with technical skills for recording cetaceans at sea and began a, a four decade long association with Bill Watkins, who he's pictured with there. Um, Bill Watkins was an amazing um, kind of Renaissance person who could build recorders to bring out at sea. Um, he also had an amazing biological intuition. Um, they made this LP back in Woods Hole at, at Hui here in 1962 with a whole bunch of different sounds. And I'm going to play a little clip of this for you. And this is actually the voice of Bill Cheville, um, which is uh, kind of fun to listen to. let that play for uh, a couple more seconds, but um, I just wanted to mention that there's been a lot more learned about sperm whales since this recording was made. Actually, Bill Watkins was very instrumental in describing these really interesting rhythmic patterns that um, sperm whales make that he called codas, and so I don't think anybody would call them monotonous and <laughs> conversationalists anymore. They're actually really fascinating. So since the time of Cheville and Watkins, who he has continue to produce cutting edge technologies in bioacoustics, including the D-tag, which is a suction cup attached tag, which I'm gonna talk a little bit more about later, but I brought one up here, which we can maybe pass around at some point. Um, also some real-time monitoring systems like this that is, um, was developed uh, in, um, in collaboration with people here at Huey um, to detect and um, transmit sounds of various baleen whale species, including that very highly endangered North Atlantic right whale and the detections of the sounds that that species are used to actually um, institute speed restrictions in areas where that species occurs. Um, also shown here, um, not uh, some autonomous gliders that uh, Mark's going to be talking a little bit more about. Um, 
But so what I'm going to actually focus on now for the next few minutes is to just tell you a little bit about my own work, which is on bottlenose dolphins. And this species has been um, the focus of a lot of, um, I don't know, kind of sensational <laughs> ideas over the years. I mean, the TV show Flipper, for anyone who's old enough to uh, have seen that. But um, a lot of, lots of books, things like that, suggesting that they have a language like ours. I think this um, Gary Larson cartoon it does a great job of encapsulating a lot of these ideas with um, scientists tallying obvious Spanish phrases on a blackboard, um, but too dumb to understand what the dolphins are saying, which may yet be true. Um, but what I'm going to focus on now is actually just telling you a little bit about what we do know. And one, one thing that we know about dolphins is that they actually make name-like sounds called signature whistles. And these are the closest things to human names in the animal kingdom. And um, they're really, really cool. I'll play a few of them for you. The see also visually on these spectrograms, you know, it's very, very distinctive sounds. A lot of what we know about signature whistles has come from a long-term research project in Sarasota, Florida that's been um, uh, uh, focuses on a resident community of dolphins of about 160 dolphins. Um, pretty much all of the animals are known. They're known age and sex. There are currently um, six living generations in some maternal lineages down there. And um, we also know pretty much all of the animal signature whistles, which is um, kind of an amazing thing. And the way that we do know all of their whistles is that we actually do these health assessments down there where we handle animals briefly and um, we can record them with these suction cup hydrophones placed directly on their melon or forehead. Um, and so that enables us to actually attribute sounds to specific individuals because um, without that, it's very difficult. They don't make a, any movements associated with, with sound production. They don't even open their mouths. See them doing that, that's a trained behavior. And so, and, and also most of the time we actually can't see them anyway. So even if they did, it wouldn't really help. So the, these recordings really help us to attribute sounds to individuals. And through that process, we've been able to build this um, catalog of signature whistles in Sarasota. This is 269 dolphin names, if you like. And um, you can really just get a sense of that immense diversity. They're extremely distinctive and really, um, really just striking in, in how, how easy they are to tell apart. Um, so one of our goals for this work in building this big catalog of whistles in Sarasota is that we hope to uh, be able to work with collaborators to develop machine learning tools for detection and classification of signature whistles. So the idea is, you know, currently they're identified visually in the field through marks on their dorsal fins. Um, we know, you know, which signature whistle goes with each of these animals. So with a network of hydrophones throughout the study area, we can actually track the movements of individual dolphins without having to go out in a boat. And we're hoping that um, by developing methods in Sarasota, where we know so much about the animals, that we can then um, take those methods to areas that are less well studied and um, hopefully apply them to be able to monitor populations of dolphins. So I, I also just wanted to mention that we do use these Z tags, these non-invasive um, uh, suction cup attached tags that can record depth, sound, and movement. Uh, they were developed here at Hui by Peter Tayek and Mark Johnson. And um, it's really great during the health assessments, we can actually hand place these tags on the animals because it's, um, otherwise they're attached with a pole, which is very hard to do on small uh, delphinids. So I'll play a few non-whistle sounds for you that we recorded on the tags, uh, just so you don't think that they only make whistles. Here's some echolocation. That to find prey, and here's some sounds we call burst pulses. That's just one of many diverse types of sounds. These ones we call quacks. That's quacking, <laughs> but I promise you, this is a dolphin. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, so these are a, a huge variety of sounds. We know very little about how they're used, but we're learning by uh, recording them with Z tags. We can also use Z tags to measure noise exposure and impacts of noise on communication. So in this sound, I'll just, you'll be hearing a, a dolphin whistling and then a, pa a boat passing by. So you can just hear what that sounds like. The dolphin making a signature whistle there.
as the boat comes in, you can hear it's going to get louder. And it, it's, it's very hard to listen to these. I mean, obviously, we can take our headphones off when we're listening to these, but the dolphins can't. So it's um, very likely very impactful for them. And we are doing some playback experiments to tag free swimming dolphins aimed at looking at how boat noise affects the ability of dolphins to hear each other. So that I will leave it to. Uh, okay. 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 I'm gonna I'm gonna exercise the moderator's prerogative and ask just a quick follow. -up. Um, I was wondering, the, with the signature whistles, is that something that they use like we use our names? Somewhat like that, but a little bit different, too, because they tend to produce their own signature whistles a lot, which I, I don't tend to just walk around saying, I'm Layla, I'm Layla, I'm Layla all the time. Um, but they do, but they can't see each other very much. So, so it seems like they're using them that way to keep track of where each other are. They do also copy each other's whistles, though, which is more like how we use names, where they would copy the whistle of another animal to... Um, initiate contact with them. They can do deep fakes. They can pretend. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Next up is uh, Aaron Mooney. Um, Aaron is a marine biologist also here at Huey, the last person from the home team on the, on the panel now. Uh, among other things, Aaron studies the effects of human-caused sounds here in the waters of the Northwest Atlantic on squid, which are becoming an increasingly important economic species. Um, but tonight, he's going to focus on work he and others at Hui are doing related to the soundscapes of, uh, of coral reefs and how we might be able to use this information to help regenerate degraded reefs also. Cool. Thanks, Ken. Thanks very much for coming here. So I'm going to take you to an entirely different ecosystem here, and that is um, coral reefs. So you may not think or may not have heard of coral reefs making sound before, but they're this really rich acoustic environment, which I'll kind of be playing to you. Um, but first, I want to kind of take a step back about think about why coral reefs are important. Well, 25% of all our marine animal life spends some time on coral reefs. Um, they're incredibly valuable economically to us, right? So in the U.S. alone, they have a value of $3.4 billion a year, um, $2.6 trillion globally in terms of uh, supporting humans in a variety of ways. A lot of that is um, shoreline protection from storms, uh, from hurricanes, um, provides food resources, and provides livelihood, particularly and disproportionately so to developing nations. And then we even get pharmaceutical projects, so HIV treatment drugs, anti-cancer drugs, pain treatment drugs have all been found on coral reefs. Um, but it's also probably, I think, it, I think of it as actually our most imperiled ocean ecosystem. So this is a picture of a reef in Maui, Molokini Crater. This is actually Mark and I have been listening to this reef for uh, since about 2015. And this is a bleaching event that occurred in 2016. And so those coral are bleaching because they're stressed, right? So they, um, um, and these ecosystems, these reefs are, are stressed from changes in temperature, increases in temperature, changes in pH, uh, nutrients, diseases, and even actually ocean noise as well. Um, we've lost already in the past 30 years, 25% of our coral reefs. Um, so these ecosystems are really essentially in crisis. The UN predicts that um, we may lose 90% of our coral reefs by 2050. So just picture any other ecosystem where we might lose 90% of that in the next 25 years. That's, that's astounding, right? So these, these ecosystems are really in crisis. And so we've been thinking about, you know, how solutions for reefs and monitoring and early warning systems of this stress. And we've been thinking about that in terms of sound um, because coral reefs are really this rich environment with first sound. So this is a spectrogram. This is, uh, Layla showed several of these. So this is essentially that image of sound. So on the y-axis is frequency, and the x-axis here below is time. Um, and this is essentially the image of, of a coral reef sound. So the higher frequency components are snapping shrimp. I'm going to play this for you in a sec, but this is this crackling background per, uh, persistent noise. And lower frequencies are fish calls, um, a diversity of fish calls there. And um, you actually even occasionally get the passing marine mammals that that go by. So I'm going to play the sound for you here. That's the initial fish. There's some whales. That's the next fish grunt. You can hear the snapping strip above. There's that humpback again. 
more fish sound, more whales. And so this sound, uh, I'm going to let it persist because it is persisting. This is constantly going on on the reefs, this chatter. Um, and so these animals are actually communicating to each other out there. Um, and these, these, um, we've been using these soundscapes essentially to monitor reef health. Um, we've been doing this around the world um, in different places, but one of our focal sites has been the U.S. Virgin Islands and the U.S. Virgin Islands National Park, and particularly the island of St. John, um, in part because it's a protected area. It's a national park. Um, it's a relatively healthy environment. There's over 300 fish species, 50 species of cor hard coral, numerous soft corals, um, over 5,000 submerged acres of protection here. Um, and so we've been monitoring this actually since about 2012, so it's one of the longest, if not the longest, underwater monitoring of any coral reef in the world. Um, it's actually even where we'll measure, one of the sites we're measuring, tektite habitat. It's in the late 60s and early 70s. It was one of the first monitoring stations in the U.S. for Navy and NASA uh, aquanauts um, as an underwater habitat. Um, and so we have some early soundscapes actually from them as well. Um, so we're monitoring uh, the sounds in the reef. We're using it with these hydrophone tools. You can see Amy April deploying one in the upper left-hand corner there. But we do a variety of other things, too, as we're assessing those reefs. So we measure the um, traditional ways. We, we have to send divers out to count the corals on the bottom, the benthic cover, the amount of algae. We look at the fish diversity and the abundances. We work with other labs that are studying new microbes there, um, larval, things like larval settlement. And of course, the, um, with 10 years of data now, um, we can begin to kind of look at disturbances of that environment as well and how that perturbs the reef environment and how that perturbs the, um, the soundscape. So we can look at, again, the effects of bleaching and how the community changes with the bleaching and the sounds change. And when we have these major Category 5 hurricanes that come through, like Hurricanes Irma and Maria, and how that disturbs those environments. And again, how we're doing that is looking at these fish sounds, because again, this, part, this environment is really rich with fish sounds. So um, this is just a sampling of Tektot Reef, that reef that was started in the, uh, for its studies in 1968. Um, but in showing you just the diversity of different fish calls that are there, these fish are, are diversity, there's a range of fish calls. And when we started counting the number of fish calls there, we're getting about 120 fish calls per minute, so two calls every second. So that is getting to a, a large number of calls there. And just in over a course of uh, a few months, um, we've, we just hand annotated now actually over 5,000 or 50,000 individual sound, sounds and over 100 different sound types. So we're actually losing track of these sound types here. Um, and uh, across three different reefs, um, this is similar to what Layla showed, but this is basically categorizing, beginning to categorize those sounds. And we have so many different sounds there. This is where we begin to kind of need to use AI and artificial intelligence and autonomous support to be any kind of support this analysis. Because once you get beyond about five categories, you begin to lose track, right? If we're over 100. Um, so we want to use some of the sound uh, and autonomous methods to begin to kind of diagnose reef health. And that's where we are right now. Um, how can we use these new techniques? And I'll just kind of review a few of these techniques for you. Um, the first is this real-time acoustic buoy that you see. So on the upper left is us pulling this real-time cost-effective acoustic recorder. It actually records the reef sound and then relays that up information up to Amazon Web Services. And then we can get that information and track those fish calls just from our smartphone. Um, we're integrating sound with a lot of other variables out there on the reef. So we're putting this out with um, autonomous vehicles, robots. Um, uh, we are looking at it in terms of um, the hydrodynamics and the currents around the reef, things, things like the nutrients and the microbes I mentioned, and, and reef, metabol reef metabolism. So we can know the energy and the oxygen consumption, consumption on those reefs. Again, sort of integrating all those sensors. And then moving to technology-based monitoring and early warning systems as well. And so this is working with Yogi Gerdhar's lab here in, um, in Woods Hole and the ecologically curious robot that he's developed. Um, and we're using automated and improved essentially AI and computer science to visually um, and, and acoustically find hotspots or really rich, um, important areas on these reefs that we want to conserve and, and preserve. That's Yogi with his, with his robot pal. Um, so, and then finally, the last thing I want to just sort of introduce you guys is how we're potentially using sound or we're using sound to, um, to rebuild reefs. So not as a, only as an early warning or an indicator of stress on those reefs, but a way to kind of replenish and rebuild those reefs. And so this is uh, just a cup of Parides asteroides um, larvae, essentially mustard hill coral. Um, this, is the, this is the larvae that the, that the adults had released, and we can capture those larvae. Um, and we can take the reef sound. And... Um, 
we can replay that reef sound that you heard before to the, on degraded reefs. So this is a degraded reef in the Virgin Islands. And we're measuring basically the, the larval settlement or the re, reattachment of those baby coral to the reef. So we're trying to use that sound to attract baby coral back to that reef and essentially regrow the reef. So this is, again, an indicator of reef health, that rich sound. If we replay that rich sound, you can get that baby coral to kind of settle on that reef. And that's sort of what this experiment is doing. We showed several, now worked with several species to show that this is uh, working. And there's our, um, our buoy here that goes out to kind of measure and generate that sound. And that's it. Thanks very much. What sort of what sort of distance over what can is are the uh, playbacks effective? So so far they're actually working out to like we measured out to thirty meters and they're actually still generating settlement or baby coral settle at thirty meters. So and we we thought it would not go that far. So it seems to be even exceeding that range right now. At least where we're measuring. Um, our final speaker is Mark Lammers. Um, Mark is a research ecologist with NOAA Hawaiian Islands Humpback Whale National Marine Sanctuary, and he uses bioacoustics to understand and protect the sanctuary's namesake whales in ways that have made the sanctuary, his sanctuary, and the sanctuary system at large a global leader in the preservation of humpbacks and other whales. Uh, he's also the overall research coordinator of the sanctuary, and their sanctuary is one of 15 marine sanctuaries in U.S. waters that includes one right off the coast here, the Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary between Cape Ann and Cape Cod. Mark? Great. Uh, thank you, Ken, and thank you, everybody, for coming um, tonight, and uh, aloha, everybody. Um, so, yeah, let's see. Uh, with this, okay. So yeah, uh, I'm here tonight to talk to you a little bit about how we're using um, acoustics to basically better understand uh, how humpback whales uh, occur and how they're distributed uh, around the Hawaiian archipelago. Now, um, many of you are probably familiar with the, the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, maybe you've even been there. Uh, but if you've been there, you've probably visited the what we call the main Hawaiian Islands over here. These are the, the high islands that are made up of Kauai, Oahu, Maui, Molokai, Lanai, Kaholawe, and Hawaii Island, also known as, uh, as the Big Island. Of, uh, but what you, what you probably are maybe not be aware of is that the Hawaiian Archipelago actually stretches about 1,000 nautical miles further to the northwest uh, through the islands and, and atolls and banks that make up the northwestern Hawaiian Islands, and which make up one of the largest marine protected areas in the world, the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. Now, the Hawaiian uh, Islands are also the principal uh, winter breeding ground of the North Pacific humpback whale population. It's estimated about half of the North Pacific humpback whale population comes to the Hawaiian Islands each year to, to winter and, and, uh, and to basically breed. And when they come to the islands, they have a strong affinity for relatively shallow waters, waters less than about 100 fathoms or about 600 feet deep. And as a result, um, the, what we call the Maui Nui region, which is where are the islands of Maui, Molokai, Lanai, and Kahulawe, are considered the epicenter of that, of that uh, breeding habitat. And that's because of the preponderance of that shallow water habitat that can be found uh, in, around those islands. Now, historically speaking, the northwestern Hawaiian Islands were not really considered to be uh, an important habit, wintering habitat for humpback whales. And that's because Back in the 1970s, some, some limited survey, aerial surveys were conducted in the area, and uh, humpback whales were not really found there. And so that led the, um, the late Dr. Lou Herman, who was one of the, the pioneers of humpback whale research in the Hawaiian Islands, to conclude that there really is no evidence of current habitation by humpback whales in uh, the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. So he thought, you know, maybe you might have a few animals kind of just passing through. So as a result, for the last several decades, there's been very little um, effort to try to um, understand or study humpback whales in, in this part of the archipelago. Also because it, this is a very difficult area to, to work in because during the winter months when humpback whales are, are present in the Hawaiian Islands, this area is really dominated by huge winter swells and, and really strong winter storms. So nobody really wants to go up there during that time of year. But in recent years, there's been more interest in trying to understand you know, whether humpback whales are really occurring there. 
Um, but we've been facing that challenge of, you know, how do we do this work in this area that's very in inhospitable during those winter months? And so for us, the answer has been to use um, acoustic monitoring. And so you might ask, well, you know, why acoustic monitoring? And well, the simple answer is that uh, many, if perhaps not most, uh, male humpback whales engage in a display of song during the breeding season. And when multiple whales come into an area, they form what what's called a, a song chorus, which I'm gonna play here for you so that you can see what that, hear, or hear what that sounds like. So as you can hear that there are lots of humpback whales singing at the same time. And as more humpback whales come into an area, that chorus gets louder and louder. And that's something that we can measure in terms of uh, the decibel level. And what we've been able to show through, through our work over the years is that this song chorusing level, the decibel level, is nicely correlated with, with the abundance of whales in a particular area. So that's all to say that basically monitoring, acoustic monitoring can not just tell us about where and when humpback whales are present, but also something about their, their relative abundance. And so that brings me to a project um, that uh, just recently concluded. Some of you might have heard of it. It's called the Sang Sound Project. It was a three-year project run by the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries to study the, the soundscapes of seven marine uh, sanctuaries and the Papahanaokea Marine National Monument. Um, and, and in our case, what we were particularly interested in was, was this question of where do humpback whales occur? So these are the eight sites that we monitored for a period of about three years. And so I've color-coded each site each with a star of a different color. And that corresponds to these different plots that you see on the, on the left-hand side. Um, each one is kind of color-coded. And the plot is really small, but on the x-axis here, on the, on the horizontal axis, you see the time of the year so in, in months. And it's basically from, de from December through about May. Uh, and then you see two lines, a blue line uh, and a red line. And the blue line is basically telling you the, the presence of humpback whale song, the daily presence of humpback whale song. Uh, uh, um, at each location. And so you can see that uh, here at the top, it's 100%. That means that, you know, the entire time, day and night, humpback whale song could be heard. Uh, the red line is an indicator of the decibel level that, uh, that, that could be uh, heard over the, over, over the season. So it's a kind of a relative measure of, of the, the, that chorusing level that I played to you. And from this, you can see a, a few, you know, different uh, you know, interesting trends. One is that at all of these locations, except at Pearl and Hermes over here, which was corresponds to this, this blue star part of the Northwest, at all the other locations, we can hear humpback whale presence um, basically continuously from January through, through about March. Um, at Pearl and Hermes, uh, that, that seems to be just the uh, thing is more, a little bit more sporadic there. So they don't really seem to be hanging out there. We're interpreting this as sort of like, you're probably just passing through here. But at all the other locations, they seem to be actually, you know, spending, you know, um, consistent time there. And if we look at the red line, this, the, the chorusing level, we can see that there are some interesting differences among these different locations. We see the highest levels of chorusing off of Maui, kind of reinforcing that idea that it's sort of the epicenter of the, you know, of the, of the whale, the, the breeding population. But we also see quite high levels of chorusing off of Hawaii Island, so down here. Uh, but also French figure trolls, which is this green, uh, green star over here. Um, Oahu and uh, Kauai are kind of intermediate. And then you see this, uh, uh, this location here, Gardner Pinnacles, which is the purple star right there. And you can see that there's whales there, but the chorusing levels are pretty low. And from this, you might kind of think, well, maybe that's just sort of like the, the northwestern edge of where humpback whales like to, like to hang out. But um, just, you know, hold on to that thought because we're going to return to it in just a second. So another way that we've been studying um, humpback whale distribution across uh, the, particularly the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands is through the use of a, of a wave glider. And so if you're not familiar with what a wave glider is, it's basically like a, a marine drone that's powered by the, by the waves and the, and the sun and it's piloted via satellite link. So you can basically make it go anywhere you want in, in, in the ocean. In our case, we used a, a wave glider that was deployed off of the Big Island of Hawaii on January 10th, off of Puoko on January 10th um, of 2020. The glider went up, uh, up along the, the, uh, the northwestern Hawaiian Island chain as far as uh, a little bit beyond Lisiansky Island and turned around and kind of came back, you know, surveying, acoustically surveying all these, uh, these, um, these different locations. I should mention that this, was, this, this, this wave glider was equipped with, uh, with a hydrophone making basically continuous recordings. In total, it traveled more than 2,600 nautical miles. 
made more than 92,000 recordings, and then returned back to to um, to Big Island on March 14th, uh, just uh, just a couple of months after it was deployed. Now, as I mentioned, um, we obtained um, more than 92,000 uh, recordings, and so that's a lot more than what we could look at or listen to. So we employed a, a machine learning tool that was developed by Google to basically help us uh, go through all of our data and tell us where a uh, humpback whale song um, um, uh, was present. And here you see kind of a, a sort of a synopsis of what, what we found there. Um, each one of these dots represents the amount of singing that was recorded in any particular, in, in a given hour of the mission. So the larger the dot, the more song was recorded uh, within, within that uh, given hour. And so from this, what you can see is that, you know, humpback whale song was clearly present at uh, nearly every bank shoal or seamount that the, that the glider uh, visited. And uh, here, uh, this will be my, my last slide, this is, uh, this is just a, a little bit more quantitative representation of, of, of the singing that was, was observed. And so what I've done is I've arranged all the different locations that the glider visited. I know the font is really, is really small here, but they've been arranged from the locations on the southeastern end of the archipelago on the right to the ones on the northwestern end on, on the left. And from here, you can see that the, the relative amount of singing uh, varied quite a bit, but you can see that towards the southeastern end, uh, we had a, quite a lot of humpback whale singing detected, but as the glider went uh, further to the northwest, that decreased uh, you know, gradually until we hit this low spot here, which was this Gardner Pinnacle location. Remember, that was that purple star that I, that I pointed out on the map where we didn't hear a lot of, a lot of singing. And, and same thing with the glider, that it just basically did not hear a whole lot of singing there at all. And so from that, we would have just assumed that, well, that's the sort of like the edge of where humpback whales hang out. But because we kept the glider going, we, what we found was that there's actually a lot of singing that occurs after beyond uh, Gardner Pinnacles between a location called Rita Bank and then this, these Northampton Seamounts. So what this is telling us is that we have kind of like a, what we call a bimodal distribution pattern of humpback whale song uh, presence, at least. And, and this has now uh, led us to, to basically um, that we may very well be looking at kind of two subpopulations of humpback whales occurring um, uh, across the Hawaiian archipelago. One that may be more kind of tied to the main Hawaiian islands, you know, to the southeast, uh, and then another that may be um, more limited to the far northwestern end of, of the northwestern Hawaiian islands. And this has now raised all kinds of questions about whether we really need to manage our population as sort of one contiguous population or potentially Two, two separate breeding populations. So it's, uh, it's, it's something that we're really interested in trying to understand more, and we're going to do some more acoustic work, but ultimately we also have to get up there at some point and, and really figure out which, which, uh, what whales those are, the ones that are far to the northwest. And I think that's all the time that I have, so um, I believe we're moving on to questions now. All right, before we move to audience questions, I just wanted to do one follow-up. Sure. And that was, um, so how is some of this information that you're gathering working its way into actual management decisions, either in the sanctuary or more broadly across the system? Yeah, so as I mentioned, you know, we're, because there's this, this kind of enticing possibility that we may be dealing with two, two, um, two populations, there's been a, kind of a question as to, so the the the, the, ones, the whales that occur in the main Hawaiian Islands, we know are they're, they're they're part of what we call the Hawaii distinct population segment, and that was a population of whales that um, was taken off of the U.S. endangered species list back in 2016 because it was considered recovered. But there are um, there's a couple of other um, distinct population segments in the North Pacific, including the, the what we call the Western Pacific distinct population segment of whales, which tends to feed off of Russia and the, the Aleutians and, and, and so on. And that one is highly endangered still. And so what's, what's happened now is that there's a question as to whether those whales that are far to the, you know, wintering far to the northwest of the, the archipelago could be part of this you know, really endangered population of, uh, of Western Pacific um, whales. And so, um, so now there's you know, some, you know, some, uh, some questions that we have to ask ourselves from a management standpoint as to whether um, if this is, you know, habitat for these Western DPS whales, then it may have to be listed as critical habitat potentially. And so, so these, you know, these are questions that are not having to be asked um, as a result of some of these findings. But I have 
Layla and Aaron and Mark come up. And uh, we have two mic runners, are Sierra and Jada, both uh, joint program graduate students here at Huey. Um, if you raise your hand, we can get a mic to you. And because we are recording this, and we want to be able to uh, to hear your uh, hear your question. And if you if you could please identify yourself, and if it's relevant, tell us where you're from. Anybody? Hi, thank you. I'm Kayla. I'm a joint program student here as well. Um, that was amazing. All of you, really cool stuff. Even though I know some of you have not, you know, it was cool to hear those sounds. But um, Mark, I had a question. I so you were talking about how they might be two distinct populations. I know that usually these songs, like they line up the songs, right? Like they all sing kind of the same song. Yeah. Are they singing different songs between those two groups or do you not know that yet? Or Yeah, that's a great question. And that is actually something that we're, we're looking at right now. So, um, you know, because the wave glider, um, you know, was just sort of doing its thing, moving along, uh, we have a lot of singing there, but the, if you're gonna do comparisons of song, you kind of have to find periods where the wave glider like went really close to a singing whale because otherwise you're just hearing this sort of background chorusing and it's really hard to know what you know what's what's going on there or you can't really differentiate who's making what sound so one of the things that we, one of the first challenges we've had is to basically go find really good high quality song where by chance the glider just sort of went by a singer and so we're in the process of doing that and once we have those identified um, hopefully at multiple locations across the survey then what we plan to do is do a, you know, a, um, a, a detailed analysis of the structure of the song and to see if we can find some evidence that what we're hearing on one end of the archipelago is either the same or, or, or different from what we're hearing on the other end. So that, that work is happening right now. Hi, I'm Karen. A uh, follow-up to that question is, have you ever correlated the age of the mammals that you think they are? to the sounds, because as humans get older, often their voices change and get lower. So I'm just wondering if there's a correlation between the age of the animal and the song that they're making. Yeah, uh, and that's another really excellent question. Um, so, so age is really hard to establish because, you know, unless you have a deceased animal, then you can usually kind of tell, like, um, you know, how it's, uh, you, know, you can make some measurements and determine roughly its age. We're, we're kind of limited in the sense that we we have um, our ability to determine ages, you know, like dependent on whether when it was first sighted. That may not be the first year, obviously, that it was born. So it's just an indicator. So then we have a window like first sighted in whatever 19, you know, 93 or something like that, and then you kind of have a general sense. But get at your 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 question. Um, we've been doing actually some work to look at the, the kind of like the qualitative differences between the song you know, between whales. And and we've been we've been kind of tying it to um, to, the, to to some of, some of the physical characteristics of the whale, so like their size. Uh, we've also kind of started looking at things like testosterone level. So it's not so much getting at the question of age, but but looking at sort of like physical measures that might relate to like their competitive fitness, let's say, you know. And and there are some interesting differences there. So even though they're all singing court, you know, sort of the same song. There's inter-individual variation that could be really useful for, for them to kind of sort of assess each other. And that's kind of the direction in which we've been going, looking at sort of the inter-individual differences. Lilo, what about you? Do you see any changes over those six generations of qualitative or quantitative differences? No, no, we don't in dolphins. But we think there that they just know each other as individuals. So every, everybody just knows who everybody else is. So, so yeah, we don't see any changes. Aaron, what about you? Do you see any differences between an old reef or newly established reef and, an old, and a more established reef? Um, well, I guess certainly, like if you have a really healthy, long established reef, it sounds very different than a reef that's been degraded. So, yeah, a nice complex reef just sounds really rich. Anybody else? Good. Yeah, and I can just quickly add, we're actually. Um, Kind of looking at that, um, although you know my focus has here on been on humpback whales. One of the sites that um, we monitor for a long time uh, in the northwestern Juan Islands was that location of French frigate shoals, which is that sort of you know, green star that you saw. And there we were for for many years we were monitoring the, the coral reef there, 
uh, one, of, one of the healthiest, most vibrant coral reefs in, you know, in, in the whole archipelago, and it was completely destroyed um, by a hurricane. Uh, hurricane Wallaka went through there, and now it's, it's, you know, it's you know, from what I understand, I've, I haven't seen it, but uh, it's, it's mostly coral rubble. And so now we're going, we, it's been hard because it's a remote area and COVID and everything, but we're going to go out and record that reef again just to see, you know, the, the extreme, like from extremely healthy to completely destroyed and see, you know, how, how, how drastic the, the, the contrast really is. But because um, it's hard because, you know, reefs degrade over time and sometimes the change can be, you know, you know very subtle, almost imperceptible, you know. Um, but in this case, you know, it was a very dramatic effect. So we're, that, that'll t kind of hopefully tell us a lot. Hi, thank you very much for speaking tonight. Um, my name is Rob. I'm actually from a, a small company called Blue IQ. We're manufacturing uh, very low, small weight cost and power uh, passive acoustic monitoring equipment. And I'm curious from, from your perspective, what's your wish list in terms of the type of recording equipment that you had <laughs> that you could have? Small weight, low cost, uh, <laughs> real-time passive acoustic monitoring equipment. Yeah. A long duration. And then a way to deal with all that data. <laughs> that's, the, that's the next step. Yeah, yeah. Um, onboard processing with the real time link. That would be, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, you asked for the wish list, right? So yeah, yeah. You're going to be very popular Talk with later, the yeah. I might add. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Meet you at the bar. <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting point. This is a data rich field. So mm -hmm. machine learning is probably becoming absolutely. Yeah. Necessary. You heard it in all our talks, right? Like yeah. we're, we have more data than we know what to do with. And that's, that's the major focus of what we're doing over these next couple of days trying to figure out how to deal with these huge sounds and, and, and really gain information from it, right? Well, yeah, for, for, uh, you know, for a number of years, you know, at the you know, early 2000s, the, the real limitation was the hardware, and there just wasn't you know, tools. We had to invent new tools. But, uh, but now, and, you know, we're, all, of course, always welcoming you know, new innovation and, and, and improvements in the tools, but, but now the, the real limitation is just the volume of data and how to, you know, how to fully exploit it. So. Data, I think there's somebody here. Uh, that was great um, discussion. Thank you. Um, my name is Alicia. I'm an astrophysicist, so I know all about large data. Um, and I'm sure you have a toolbox for all the statistical methods you use to find pattern recognition. And one thing that we've learned is even after you throw everything you've got at it, sometimes by coordination with the visually impaired scientists in astrophysics, they can actually have a better intuition for which packages to use in addition to their own intuition from a heightened ability to find patterns. Um, they've really explored things that we didn't expect, glitches and pulsars, that sort of thing. Just an idea, it's, it's a great way to get that community involved also because um, yeah. they're there <laughs> and yeah, well, we need them. You're, you're right and you know most of us that work with sound we sometimes, you know, listen to it, but we're very visual, and so we tend to spend more time looking at it, you know. But uh, I could imagine somebody, you know, that's visually impaired, they, they, they probably would, you know, find a certain richness in just listening to the sounds that, you know, we may, we just might not be able to appreciate, you know. So, so it's, that's a really nice suggestion, yeah. And I think, we, and we have a partnership with the Penneke School through Amy Perkins, Bauer. Perkins. Perkins, Perkins School, I'm sorry, no. In the Peggy's, but the Perkins, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. we've worked with. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Are really great at listening to sound. Oh, <laughs> uh, sure. There's a couple of there. there. And then. Hi, my name is Donna. Um, I was just curious. Um, you showed the boat sound going through and interrupting them, and that sound waves can go 2,500 miles. How about the boats? Like, how far does their sound travel, and how how much does it impact? not just the immediate animals, but those that are quite a ways? That's a great question. And that's going to really vary a lot depending on habitat and type of boat. So like large ocean freighters are going to generate low frequencies that will travel very far, um, I, I guess. And, and how far is going to depend a lot on bottom characteristics and depth and things like that, but many miles for sure. Um, and, and even those smaller recreational boats can, uh, we can detect the lower frequency parts of them for, for miles as well. So, um, but you know, at what, at what level it stops becoming um, noxious to them, we don't know. We, we really just know, you know, sort of a rumble, low rumble in the background is 
something that bothers them. We, we... So with the um, the wind turbines, so the vibration from them, are, would they cause noise to the animals or, or the vibration? The boat causing noise or is it causing vibration or it's probably causing both? I mean. Yeah, the boat is really causing, yeah, I mean, the, the sort of cavitation of the, of the engine is, is creating noise. I think the vibration of the um, wind turbines I don't think is generating substantial noise. You might be able to speak well, to that. Well, like there's low frequency, yeah, like sort of vibrational. That's actually the two are linked, like sound pressure and the vibrational component are, are linked. They're, and so they're both always there, and they're both going to kind of, it's going to be low amplitude, like low level, but, but fairly persistent. And we don't really know effects on that and but then we also know things like so you know so we can play healthy resounds and we can get coral larvae to settle that actually that low frequency wind turbine noise might you know increase muscle settlement around here right or oyster settlement or something like that it might might have a, a sort of a you know a reef attracting effect right so there's other folks that have shown that um even just like on the hulls of ships you get more biofouling but the, you know so the animals are choosing to kind of settle there because of that vibrational noise so, um, yeah, so we're still kind of learning. I mean, we're still learning basically from Europe. They're the ones who are so far ahead. Um, yeah. Hi, I'm Amy. I'm a scientist here at Huey. Uh, I have a question for, for Mark and Layla. So Aaron talked about using sound for, for interventions, to, you know, to help marine life. And I'm wondering if there's any examples of that or some dreaming that you can do about how you might use sound to help enhance the populations of, of humpback whales, of dolphins, especially with your new friend over there that's going to give you any kind of technology. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Kyle. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. I yeah. uh, hadn't thought about that yeah. uh, in terms of, you know, how we might use sound to, well, I mean, you know, if we're kind of thinking out of the box, um, you know, of course, you know, so the function of song has been debated for a long time. I mean, humpback whales has been debated for a long time. But you know, one idea um, you know, has been that uh, that it, in addition to other functions, it could serve as a kind of like a homing beacon. So whales that are at a you know distance kind of come to an area because they hear song, and so it kind of like creates almost like a positive feedback loop. And so uh, you know, again, thinking out of the box, if we wanted to you know, to, <laughs> to increase the whale population. I don't know if it would work, but, you know, you could project humpback whale song and see if, see if whales show up. I mean, once they realize that there were no other whales, I don't know how long they'd stick around, but uh, <laughs> they're a little bit different from coral larvae that just think it's a nice place to sit, you know, settle. But uh, um, I don't know, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting idea. You know, it'd be kind of, I don't know if we'd get that permitted. That might be hard to get, you know, <laughs> to get approved. But. Or, to, or to maybe help them find prey too, right? As Prey populations are moving and, mm, and yeah. climate, and it's harder to find because whales are amazing carbon sinks, right? Yeah, so yeah. as we're thinking about carbon sequestration in the ocean, if we can increase their population and absolutely. intervene in some way to help build those up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They're, they're, they're amazing carbon sinks. They're, they, they're like fertilizing the ocean. So they're, they're a really critical component to not just carbon fixing, but, you know, but, you know um, dispersing nutrients, especially iron and, you know, that kind of thing. And so... So yeah, I, I agree. I mean, you know, we need whales, and uh, that's actually been one of the kind of discussions we've been having in, in Hawaii. You know, with climate change, uh, there's sort of this, this thought that you know these these uh, migratory species are going to have sort of a poleward shift, and so you know we've been starting to talk about like, well, you know, are are we even going to have a lot of whales in the next you know few decades coming down to the Hawaiian Islands, or if they're going to really have to shift their you know the distribution further? Uh, north to find food potentially, and how is that going to affect our local ecosystem? Because the whales are not just coming there and just taking up space. Um, there's a tremendous ecosystem that gets created around them. Um, they, uh, there's a lot of fish that eat their skin. Apparently, skin shedding is something that is maybe one of the reasons why they can't even come to the, the warmer waters um, at, uh, uh, during the winter. Uh, we've now seen more and more that there's defecation, so there's some suggestion that there may be some amount of foraging. So if that goes away, how could that potentially impact the, the ecosystem there in the Hawaiian Islands? So, so it's you know, besides just sort of providing a lot of you know um, revenue for the tourism industry and so on, um, there I think there may be some real ecological consequences if our whales were to you know uh, 
um, start to show up in smaller numbers or, or, move, or shift further away? I'll just add just one thing to that is that not uh, totally different from what you're saying, but rather than a kind of a positive stimulus, maybe a negative stimulus to try to keep um, any marine mammal away from like fishing gear, from getting entangled. So like playing back killer whale sounds is extremely potent for a lot of species. So that, I mean, that's a possibility. I think it would have, you know, and very carefully, <laughs> but that's one possibility. I'm going to take one more question, then we're going to have to continue the discussion at the reception. That's somebody right here. I'm uh, Jim Hain, and this is a question for Layla. The uh, question that's front and center is, uh, and I wonder if you have any view on the impact or potential impact of wind farms on right whales. Uh, I don't know if I'm necessarily the best person for that. Aaron and I were talking about it because he's been involved in some of the work um, learning about you know, trying to develop med mitigation measures for um, wind farms. For but, squid. So, for squid, okay. <laughs> but, and know. Yeah, yeah. I see <laughs> but, so, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of work going on to try to really mitigate um, any potential impacts on right whales. I know the um, uh, NR uh, some of those organi organizations have whole, you know, plans in place that they're trying to implement. Um, so I, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful, I'm very hopeful that those are going to be implemented and, and that they're going to be able to try to, um, you know, minimize how much activity is happening, you know, in the times when the whales are in those areas. Yeah, that's a really critical question, right? Because obviously, like, Europe's farther advanced in terms of right whales, but they don't have the right whales to kind of have the early studies, right, of the impacts. And so we're, we're sort of going to make, you know, there's... There's a big effort right now. Uh, Duke University is the lead, but who is a part of it? Trying to understand, you know, when they first put in the in the um, uh, the vineyard wind wind farm, you know, where where are the right whales going to be and detecting those right whales. And so we're using our, you know, together in this consortium, these real time buoys, and so alert if they're in the area um, to kind of you know shut down potentially shut down the pile driving, shut down the construction. Um, there, it's like we're everyone's critically aware that that is going to be a huge concern. No one quite knows what actual impacts they'll have on them, but um, yeah. Yeah, and I'll say that, um, you know, although we don't have right whales in, in Hawaii, um, Hawaii, the, the whole offshore wind energy um, development movement is, is sort of moving to the west. So, you know, kind of like from Europe to the east coast of the United States to the west coast, and, but Hawaii is, is you know, is, is sort of down the road. and. And we've already started to have discussions as to, you know, how this might impact, you know, our humpback whales. So we're keeping a close eye on what, you know, people are learning over here because, um, you know, what, what you guys learn is going to, you know, influence ultimately what it's done, I think, in Hawaii as well. I just want to wrap up by uh, acknowledging again Elizabeth and Henry Morse, Jr., for their support of the Morse Colloquium. I want to thank you for joining us tonight. And I would like you to join me in thanking our panelists, Mark Lammers, Leila Say, Aaron Mooney. And uh, please feel free to join us in the lobby for reception to continue the uh, discussion. And we will bring the DTAG and stick it on some of you. <laughs>